This is the CPU I have been using for the past four years or something like that. And this is the PC that's been using it. I'm not sure if you remember the upgrade to that PC there. But now it's time to upgrade and it's time to upgrade to the 13900K. Whoa. I'm quite excited about that. It's an upgrade day. So we should all be excited. And we should also be excited about this one's entertainment. Looking for a cheap way to license your windows? Check out WhoKeys through the links in the video description. Make sure to use the code TN20 to get a 30% off. Paste the license to the activation settings and you're all done. This license is for Windows 10, but you can upgrade it to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Microsoft Office 19 license. Use the same code TN20 to get a 30% off. Check out WhoKeys.com in the video description below. All right, I've been putting off this upgrade for a very long time, but now it's time we do it. My editor has a day off today, so it's time to upgrade the PC so we can get more videos done faster. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear the old PC apart, but half apart because that is the key thing about PCs. You don't have to upgrade everything and I'm not going to upgrade everything. I'm only going to upgrade the things I need to upgrade and then boom, back to work. That's the Soltec 3090 Ti. It's been lovely. Alrighty, here's the old board and we've got the CPU there. We're going to clean that up in a moment. RAM, a lot of this stuff is going to be moved to the new platform. We're going to be using the best create the motherboard possible, in my opinion. The ASUS Z790 ProArt Creator Wi-Fi. And you might be saying, look, you said that the Z690 is cheaper and exactly the same. Yes, but at this point in time, the actual pricing for the Z790 is cheaper than the Z690 because I think they've ended producing the Z690 and now the Z790 is the board to be re replaced with. So I'm going to go with this one. And then we've got the CPU, the 13900K. I'm not going to close the socket just because we're going to be doing something extra as well. You might have heard of contact frames for the 12th and 13th gen and I have bought a contact frame but there's some from Thermal Grizzly contact frames but they cost like four times as much as something from the light of Thermal Rite which I have over here and this one costs less than 10 quid or something like that but because of the 13900K I'm wanting to get as much performance out there as possible and because I'm using it long term probably a lot of the heat goes into the CPU so I don't want the CPU to bend. Now, this is not necessary, but it's an extra step to get some extra performance. Every few degrees here is important to me. I thought these socket screws are gonna be very, very tight, but they're very, very easily kind of screwed together. Here's the socket cover, and then the other side. We need the screws. And then here's the contact frame, and basically this is just a one piece of a uh, metal that goes around it and then just slots into the cpu so i guess it's just gonna go on just like that and that's that's really it and i'm just making sure that they're not overly tightened but just tight so that we're making even pressure on the CPU and that's it it's installed now the contact frame actually comes with thermal paste but I'm not going to be using that thermal paste I've got something much better planned which is I researched and this should be the best thermal pastes in the world okay so this is the thermal grizzly cryonaut cryonaut and we're going to be putting that there but not yet because I don't want to mess up the thermal paste there because we're going to put a few other things in here first so now the SSDs and I'm going to be filling up all all the four M.2 SSDs on this motherboard. One thing I did upgrade was the OS SSD. Sabrent Rocket 4.0 that I've been using for a very long time and it's super fast, it's still okay drive, but I want to do a clean install because Ryzen and Intel, whenever you switching platforms, it's best to do clean install of Windows. And just in case I forgot some kind of, you know, programs or something like that. I want to still have that previous drive so I can boot it off uh, like an M.2 enclosure on another PC to check, okay, how did I have it set up so I can like get the new PC set up absolutely perfectly and without any problems or mimic exactly the same workflow. So nothing's really changed, just the platforms changed, okay? 
So the good thing about the previous motherboard, the Aero board from Gigabyte, the, this is the X. 570s one is that it does have thermal pad underneath as well as on the top so this Sabre rocket drive had actually some of the NAND on the bottom as you can see there's one two three four probably chips there so 256 gigs each and there's also the SK Hynix I think this is the controller there so it's nice to cool these down as well but the new drive you're going to see in a moment that will have chips only on the top side which is going to be fine on the new motherboard one drive that we're going to be pulling over is the Seagate Fire Cuda 530. This is the two terabyte version. This is one of the best crater drives you can get because of the high terabytes written spec and just the performance is like up to 7.3 gigabytes per second speeds. Then another drive we're going to be pulling over is this 512 gigabyte Samsung 950 Pro. This is one of the first VNAND M.2 NVMe SSDs from Samsung. I've had this since 2016, I think. But because it's still working, I'm not just going to retire it. And I'm going to use this as the cache drive on my PC. So I'm just installing that in the bottom slot there. And I'm still going to keep using it until this dies. Because I'm not going to use it in anything else. And for cache, this is plenty fast. And on the bottom over here, here's another drive. This is the Kingston KC3000. This is one of the fastest top drives there as well, next to the likes of Seagate Fire Cuda 530, Samsung 990 Pro and so on. Super fast, up to 7.3 gigabytes per second, something like that as well. And this is another two terabyte drive. And this is another one of my project drives, okay? So there's two project drives, one two terabyte, one two terabyte. I wish I had four and four to upgrade, but you know, everyone has budget constraints and I'm trying to make this upgrade as cheap as possible and trying to use already parts here that perhaps are not being used anywhere else because that's always bonus, isn't it? But then for the OS drive, what I upgraded to is this Western Digital Black SN850X drive. So this is a new like top end drive from Western Digital. As you can see on the bottom, there's nothing there and all the NAND and controllers and everything is on the top, which is good. But this is the top, one of the top, like top two, I think. This one and the 990 Pro are one of those drives that are the fastest in terms of OS and programs and like random read and write, write speeds. Obviously the sequential read and write speeds are super fast as well, but I wanted something just super, super snappy and fast for the OS and programs, because that's what we're gonna be using every single day. Okay, motherboard is pretty much done. And why I'm using this Asus Pro at motherboard is because I have Thunderbolt, first of all, super, super fast and important. Second of all, 10 gigabit and 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, dual Ethernet ports without having an extension card is absolutely fantastic. Ton of super fast USB ports. That's all what we want to see. Super fast front panel USB-C connector. Now I am intending to use the same cooler that I had over there. And I have one of the best coolers you can get for, you know, AIOs. This is the Arctic Liquid Freezer 420. Two. And I've just got the LGA 1700 mounting kit and I'm going to mount that in there before I'm going to put thermal paste on because if you drop anything or go past you might scrape on there with that. So I'm going to get that installed. Now this is one of those things that I do not like about the Arctic freezer coolers is that these standoffs that you're going to have to screw on, you're going to have to find these stickers that go on the standoff, well actually on the holes of the motherboard, just because if you screwed in just this standoff, it will scrape the motherboard and often these traces, as you can see, there's already wires on top of this motherboard, probably some kind of RAM connectors, so you can literally just shave them off and absolutely wreck your motherboard because of that. So I'm going to have to look around and see if I've got any Arctic uh, stickers around because uh, I need them. And da-da, I found some. Because uh, I'm constantly like changing the coolers, often these stickers just get ruined and you can't use them again. I wish there was some kind of a plastic already applied to these so we could literally just not faff around with these stickers. 
And I'm going to put these stickers on the standoffs, not on the motherboard, because if I ever take this off, boom, I've got a clean motherboard, first of all, and these standoffs can be used again. <laughs> And now, here's another thing. I'm actually going to have to remove this plastic back cover here because I'm not sure if you knew, but some of the motherboards, what happens with this particular cooler is that this back little plastic cover is actually going to start hitting these capacitors on the motherboard and you're going to have to get it off. There is actually a special like a replacement that you can get for this instead, but Another option is just to take it off and it's completely fine. Now it's going to reveal a little bit of bare bones kind of a like a like a board in here. OK, it's just the back cover there that goes over this and you can just take it off. So time to put this motherboard in. Now do it very, very gently and try to get it in a way so that you're not sliding it over the standoffs of the motherboard. The cool thing is with this contact frame, you're actually going to get much cleaner thermal paste, paste clean as well afterwards because um, you're not going to get it all over the place. Time for this thermal paste. So here's how this works. We're going to undo this cap and then we're going to pull this, this guy on. Okay. This is little like a rubber, rubbery end there, if you can see. And then you push the syringe until the thermal paste comes out, just a bit like that, all right? And then now you're gonna just apply it. I know that the thermal paste is all over the CPU, and when I'm gonna put this on, the IHS gets good coverage with the heat sink. Make sure you keep pressure on there so it's not gonna peel off because that might ruin your uh, thermal paste application. Once the corners, two corners are tight, then you can remove your hands. And I left the RAM installation a bit later just because it's easier to get around and then spread it nicely around so you don't have these big sticks of RAM in the way. But now it's time for the RAM installation. And I've got 64 gigabytes of DDR5. This is the Vengeance RGB. And this is 64 gigabytes and this is 5600 mega transfers per second and cl36 so it's quite fast ram but this was quite good price as well on a deal so i went with this one now there is a bit of a gamble to be honest that i'm doing this because this is not in the qbl list of the motherboard we'll see how this is gonna do but i think it's gonna be fine another thing i'm gonna have to upgrade is the psu and I'm going to use this Fantex Revolt X 1200 watt platinum power supply. So it's a bit more power efficient than 80 plus gold, okay, which is good for creators if you're using the PC like 24 seven. The more you use it, the more you're going to save on the you know power efficiency. And we're going to be using this at least 40 hours a week or something like that, sometimes rendering overnight. So the more power efficient this is, the more it's going to save. Now, this is slight downgrade from our 80 plus titanium, which this Be Quiet Dark Power 12 was here. But 850 watts, I don't think is quite enough for the specs we're going to be going for, because as well as having the 3900K, we're also going to be putting that 4090 in there. So we're going to need a bit more juice than that. Before I'm going to put the GPU in, I'm going to do a little bit of cleaning of uh, the fans. Like I can see there's a little bit of dust in the fan, so I'm going to take the chance now to give it a bit of a clean so we can actually get some more performance, uh, you know, back out of because it's a better cooling. The beautiful, beautiful GPU upgrade from 3090 Ti to 1490. 
I have actually already tested this MSI 1490 and we've a little bit done the testing in, in the previous rig with the 1490, seeing how much of an increase this is. Now, the biggest increase what we're going to get is AV1 encoding, if we are going to do that. And we're going to get much better and more efficient GPU performance. And that's what I like. Like the GPU is not going to be as hot inside there, which is much nicer. So the 1390 Ti has still 450 watt TDP or GDP. This one is the same, but this one actually doesn't reach that 450 as much. And it's much more efficient and bigger cooler. So it's just going to run cooler and faster. And actually, if you look at the SAG, the SAG is not bad, almost non-existent even without a SAG bracket, which is pretty, pretty good. And this one has three power connectors, okay? So this is not like one of the OC cards, which as creators, we don't really need anyway. Alrighty, the PC works, it's all set up, and it is fantastic. Okay, I'm just gonna share some of the upgrades now and some of the things that uh, basically this can do. Obviously not a lot has changed in terms of the outside and visuals and design, it's just the same, but I am just super happy with the performance and I'll show you in a moment why. The only annoying thing for me is the Corsair RAM that you can't adjust it on Armory Crate or any other like unified um, RGB software really. So you have to use IQ which just means like there's another app running in the background which I'm not quite happy with. The MSI card the same. I can't quite get it to work with the Armory Crate or IQ. So I'm just gonna leave it cycling the RGB there. It's not that but that much but I wish I could make it white. That would be really really nice. Before I started this video I actually did the test in Premiere Pro with my previous uh, PC. So the 3950X, as you can see here, the 16 core processor, and then the RTX 3090 Ti with 64 gigs of RAM. There was four 3600 uh, mega transfers per second. And these are the scores there. And you might be looking at them thinking, flipping egg, if I had those scores, they would be amazing. But you've got to understand, this is exactly what we're, gonna, what we're doing every single day. And every little piece of performance and time increase is just gonna make us um, more money if that makes sense so these are the results and here are the new results before i'm going to show you the new results i also want to mention that the ram there remember i said i'm going to take a gamble and see if the xmp is going to work the xmp is actually working absolutely fine and this xmp is at 56 100 mega transfers per second as you can see and when i was loading the xmp on bios there is actually an xmp tweak profile for this ram which basically means that asus has already tested this exact same of ram in their labs and they know that they can squeeze a little bit more performance out from this ram and they're going to give you an extra like xmp profile let's say look this is a little bit faster better timings now the results look at them 1574 extended and standard overall 1789 absolutely insane now when i was doing this test i actually ran the hardware monitor in the background there as well which has been running ever since and now here we can see some of the maximums and see how you know it performed so during this test we saw that the maximum temperature was 89 degrees this is the core temperatures okay some sensors on the cpu uh, were 90 degrees okay the cpu package temperature that reads the highest sensor value on the actual cpu so wherever that one was it was 90 degrees the package temperature but the cores were reached 89 degrees maximum we pulled 304 watts which is absolutely ridiculous but the minimum has been 10.9 watts which is also absolutely amazing and look at this right now i'm browsing this here it's 23 watts something like that pulled from the socket it's absolutely 17 18 watts that's super super efficient in terms of the clock speeds two cores have been 5.8 gigahertz and then six cores have been 5.5 and then the rest of the e cores have been 4.3 gigahertz each so that's really really good in terms of the percentages 
the extended overall score is 50% faster, standard overall score 64% faster, e extended export score 51% faster, extended live playback score 58% faster, standard export score about 40% faster, standard live playback is more than doubled 112%, Effect speed is 40% faster and GPU score is 37% faster. Now, am I happy about that performance? Absolutely. This is going to be absolutely exciting. So I'm going to do like a long term test as well. So you can see like in a few weeks time what's it been like and if I've noticed any differences in terms of the editing and so on. But there's one more test that I'd like to do with you, which is the Cinebench and the temperature test to see how good is the cooling how good is the arctic liquid freezer and how good is the thermal paste application the contact frame as well as just how much power we're going to be pulling through okay so this cinebench is quite crazy i'm going to put 10 minutes on and we're going to see how long does it take for it to throttle we're going to do first test first quickly zero this Let's have a look at the thermal throttling here nope no thermal throttling there's 22.9 23 degrees in this room we pulled 335 watts which is absolutely ridiculous okay we hit 39,867 points the multi-core enhancement is on from the bios we're just pushing as much through as possible and uh, to be honest i didn't expect that i I still thought that we're going to thermal throttle at some point. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put on 10 minutes and let's see how many runs do we do until we're going to thermal throttle. If we're going to thermal throttle, okay? Let's see how good is it able to keep up with this, um, you know, 337 watts pulled from the socket, okay? Some parts of the CPU core, interestingly, they go higher and then a bit lower as well. I'm just wondering when... Probably the liquid gets round or P core 5 and P core 7 have been 97 degrees maximum. Okay, we have thermal throttled. The third run we did thermal throttle. P core 7 thermal throttled slightly, which meant that it can't hold that 5.5 gigahertz here, this one, that long and somehow thermal throttled so that it had to pull the frequency down because the temperature got so high. Guys, we're still pulling 340 watts from the socket. Okay, Pico 7 and 5 have thermal throttled. Yeah, Pico 7 has gone 100 degrees and Pico 5, 99 degrees. But look at that, the clock speeds are still kind of staying there. 4.3, 5.5, that's insane. Look at that, we've hit the PL1 limit now. PL1 limit by default from the BIOS is 253 watts, okay? And as you can see, we're not pulling any more around there. And now suddenly CPU package is just 80 degrees, which means the cooling is absolutely insane. Core temperatures are 72 maximum there. And let's have a look at the clock speeds as well. 5.1 and 4 gigahertz. That looks pretty good to me. And we're still hitting those clock speeds. And it's not even very warm in there. So the cooling is absolutely fine. Now I'm going to try testing all of the temperatures like now for the whole days of editing that we do. And let's see like how high is it going to go. But most likely in our editing, we're never going to see it thermal throttle just because we're never going to be using the CPU like that. There's going to be a combination of things at work like GPU, CPU and RAM and so on, but not so intensely like a CPU. So I think that's fine. Now, that's not the only thing we're going to be upgrading, but at least the PC is now working and uh, we can put it back to where it's going to be. Another thing we'll be upgrading is the monitor. This is the MSI Summit MS321 Up. And uh, it's quite a nice monitor for Kratos. Individual calibration report. And the average Delta E is 1.21, which means very color accurate.
So, the monitor is on. Look at that, the beautiful 4K. I love the design of the monitor as well and how small bezels on this side there is. But MSI has done a little trick there as well. When you look at the screen, the actual screen glass goes further than the actual LCD panel. So you do have a little bit of a black edge, but when the monitor is off, you won't notice it because it's um, all like the same kind of glass. The monitor also comes with this shade that you can install on the monitor to get better viewing angles if you are in a very reflective room or something like that. All you do is do that, it's magnetic, and voila, you have a little bit of a kind of editing and you know, create the monitor there. In terms of the cables, you get one HDMI cable that you saw over there. We've got one USB Type-C to Type-C cable, and this is a video cable because it does support USB-C video input as well. Then we have USB 3.0 upstream port because this monitor is also USB hub because there's USB ports, there's SD card ports, which we're gonna talk about in a moment as well, but you need that cable for that to connect to your PC for that. Then we've got one display cable, and then you've got this dual jack to single jack cable basically, for where you've got the dual port for microphone and speakers combo, so three stripes on this jack to the two separate microphone and headphone jack. So what are some of the things that you'll be looking for when upgrading or getting a creator monitor? And let's talk about the specs of this monitor at the same time. First of all, I'm looking for a large screen estate, 32 inches, that's a tick for me. Then I'm looking for a high resolution, this one, UHD or 4K panel, which is another tick for me. In no particular order, I'm looking for the color space and color accuracy. So this monitor here is a 95% DCI P3 uh, Golocament in terms of their color space and 136% sRGB. Now my current monitor that I've been using or the editor's been using, which he actually keeps using because I want this one because this one is better because I'm using just the dead cheap 27 inch 1440p or 1080p monitor even so even the main editing monitor there is 100% sRGB and or Adobe RGB so it's really meant for kind of photo or 2D design where the color space isn't that wide but if you're working with video and log formats and you've got very large color space like these Blackmagic cameras and Sony cameras were uh, recording log and the color space is quite large. We want DCI-E P3 because that will come helpful. And to have a color accuracy at 1.21, I think is what we read from there, is absolutely insane. Now, any monitor that is below three really is quite good. Below two is very, very good. And then below one is like top end high, high crate the monitor. But this is kind of in the very, very good price range and you get a lot of specs in return as well. So this is 10-bit panel, and why I'm doing that is because it's 8-bit plus FRC, which basically means that it fakes the 10-bit color. So you do get kind of all of the 10-bit colors, but it's not a true 10-bit. And that's where this monitor is a bit more affordable than some of the true 10-bit monitors. True 10-bit basically means that you do have the 1.07 billion uh, shades or colors. Whereas this one, you have pixels around it, flicker very fast, two separate colors, and then you get all of the colors of that 10-bit. So basically the panel itself is 8-bit, but because the pixels can flicker very, very fast side by side, you get actually 10-bit color. I like that the coating of this is kind of a matte anti-glare coating as well, which helps with reflections if you do have any in this room. Like here, I've got a lot of lights and things when I'm filming, and I've got another monitor over there, which this will be replacing now. Then it's good to have non-reflective uh, kind of a screens. Because this one is a little bit more reflective than this one. I like that one, and so is this one. In terms of video inputs, it's got one display port 1.2, it's got two HDMI 2.0B ports, and it's got one USB type C port, which is a display port alternative mode with power delivery of up to five volts and three amperes. So if you do want to run your MacBook and charge it at the same time, you're not really going to charge the MacBook at the same time because it's only going to get you 15 watts of power. Then we've got three USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A ports, which are five gigabits in speed and the upstream connection is five gigabits in speed as well. There's headphone and microphone jack, as well as an SD card reader. 
The aspect ratio is 16 by 9 and the contrast ratio 1000.1. It is Visa Display HDR 600 rated as well for HDR content, but I don't think this is the monitor to get HDR content or edit it on there, but it's still pretty, pretty good. It's got all sorts of smart technologies in there as well, like a KVM switch, picture in picture mode. If you want to have two separate devices show on this at the same time, you can, you know, split the screen, have one device on that side, one on this side, if you wanted to. And then the design and the monitor stand is super, super nice as well. You have this bronze design around there. You can move it left to right and then up and down. And the up and down is balanced very, very well. So, you know, you can just push it up and then it kind of stays there wherever you have it. Unfortunately, you can't turn it vertically and have it in portrait mode. But in order to adjust it to your table needs and like what looks good for you, this is very good stand. The stand has also very nice cable management in the back to make the table look very nice and clean. In terms of pricing, what I've been recommending previously is the BenQ BD3200U, which my editor uses and what we have been using in the past good few years. But this one is slightly more expensive. So this one comes in roughly around $700. Check it out in the description below if you want to pick it up but it's only about $70 more expensive than the BenQ, but it offers quite a few extra features, like a bit of a larger color sp space, more accurate colors, and you get a shade with it, as well as more modern design. The BenQ has big, big bezels there, whereas this one is much, much smarter, much more straightforward, as you can see. And the last thing we're gonna be upgrading is this table. Not sure if you remember, but this has been you know with the channel for a lot of years and if you take the nice little desk mat off you can see it's absolutely scratched but that's not the worst bit it absolutely wobbles like crazy and is bent into a banana so this middle bit here is like much lower than the sides which is a uh, you know not ideal especially if we built the 19k pc for damien on it uh, people kept commenting whoa get a new table well we're gonna get a new table now. Okay, I'm not sure if you knew this, but underneath the white desk, I had been putting all the stickers from all the products that I've, I've been seeing or getting. So if there ever was a sticker in there, then I've been putting it in there. Ryzen, Intel, look at that 10th gen Core i9. Firecuda, T4s, Kingston, Ryzen. Ooh, Ryzen Threadripper there as well. Look at that, all sorts of Corsair, Fantex. Probably from this angle, you can see the bendiness of the of the table. Can you see how it goes into a banana? So the table is now on, and by the way, this is 100% bamboo from well-managed forests. So that's pretty cool, like a solid bamboo uh, top. So it's a little bit different than what we usually see, but I'm quite liking this like solid top. This is not like moving at all. It's properly solid and you can see it's thick, nice bamboo there. So this is an ergonomic desk, which means sit stand and you know, you've got the motors here to make it go up and down and so on and then you know save settings there which i have done already this is one of their most affordable kind of a legs set which is the e7 model if you want to check that one out i'm going to leave it linked in the description below as well as that top you can get it straight from them this uh, top from flexi spot but if you want you can have any of your own tops on it as well if you want on there but the cool thing is there is a usb port on this side as well so you can like that just like charge your devices if you want from that usb port 
just a cool little thing. I like that the cable management underneath is actually improved. Our editor's desk in the back over there is a much, much um, older version of this, but I am liking this. Okay, someone was wondering what's the desk setup there. Then um, here's the MSI Summit screen, as you can see there. And then just over there is the Blackmagic. And then I've got the monitor here so I can see how much is left and if it's recording and all that for the camera. And then if I'm looking at the monitor, I'm not looking too far off the camera angle, which means it's nice. Then I've got another 27 inch here, light up like that vertically. So when we're doing live stream or something, I can see a stuff in there. And because it doesn't fit landscape there, I'm going to put it portrait because otherwise I'm going to get in front of that monitor there which is fine i've got the eight and mini there for all the cameras so this camera the upper camera and then the side camera which is this one here is all linked up there so this is that cable that goes somewhere over there and then if i've got a pc or something like that so this is set up so this is where i'm recording the videos preparing the videos and doing everything here all righty there we are so this is my desk setup where i'm filming the videos, but I'm also preparing for the videos here as well. So this is the whole desk setup. I've got monitors all the way around, the streaming setup, everything is here. In fact, I've got actually spare monitors turned around over there, like little camera monitors that I have linked up to the testing setup over there. And then sometimes I have another keyboard there, so I don't have to go there in order to put the next test on or something like that. It all happens here because I don't have a lot of space in this room. I'm gonna have to utilize this one desk to do everything like where i'm working where i'm filming where i'm doing everything so there's two desks or like cabinets behind there as well for a, few, a little bit of storage and all that so if you want to check out the upgrades this uh, desk or any of the pc or monitor upgrades i did check them out in the description below i'm going to leave it down there also you don't need any tools to build the desk by the way i did use the drill just to save some time but it comes with this one and you can just completely finish building the desk with just this <laughs>